Players in video games have an unspoken agreement that when we do a quest that is especially hard, the reward we get at the end will be especially sweet. Quid pro quo. That's Latin for this armor set better be f worth it. But what happens when a game breaks this most sacrosanct of pacts and offers up a reward for completing a staggeringly tough challenge that is at best hilariously rubbish and at worst insultingly terrible? We're extremely annoyed, is what happens. And we make a video about the worst offenders, is what happens. <laughs> Behold these awful rewards for incredibly tough quests and beware, spoilers, for the following games. What about the cave? I will have someone take care of the cave as well. No Stone Unturned is probably the hardest quest in Skyrim, a game that regularly asks you to kill actual dragons. But you won't get far into this quest, which involves the Dragonborn attempting to retrieve a number of lost gems, before you'll be begging for a dragon to rock up and bite you in half, so eye-twitchingly, infamously tedious is no stone unturned. The quest begins should the Dragonborn find an unusual gem lying around. The one who can identify this is Vex, from the Thieves' Guild. Been a while since I've seen one of those. What you've got there is a stone of Baron Zaya. The Stone of Baron Zaya you retrieved, it turns out, is one of 24 identical gems taken from the crown of a long-dead queen, kicking off what we'd love to call a treasure hunt across Skyrim to find the remaining 23, but in good conscience, we cannot. Because treasure hunt implies there will be clues, which there are not. Also, that there will eventually be treasure, which there is not. It's hard to fully describe how staggeringly difficult it is to hunt out these tiny gems in the vastness of Skyrim, seeing as there's no indicator of where to look, and that the stones could be absolutely anywhere, from the deepest corner of a ship's hold to an innocuous bedside in some rando's house. This means the only way to find all 24 is to scour absolutely everywhere in Skyrim's roughly 15 square in-game miles of townships, caves and dungeons. Knowing the whole time that the odds of finding a Stone of Baron Zaya are always extremely slim, at least compared with the odds of finding someone pissed off you're robbing their bedroom, for which, sorry Torbjorn, we can only apologise. You're not supposed to be here. Ah, <laughs> oh, my apologies always come out wrong. Pour through enough belongings in enough bedrooms and crypts and wind up enough ghosts in the process and you can, eventually, through saintly patience and commitment, track down every single stone. By which point you'll have made enemies of pretty much everyone in Skyrim, become the world's foremost plunderer of hidden gems, be sick of the sight of said gems, and be very, very ready for your reward. But first... You must do an additional extra quest, finding the actual crown of Baron Zaya the stones were taken from, which involves a huge dungeon crawl to find and, oh look, more ghosts. Do this, however, and if you still have any of your human lifespan left, you can return to Vex for your ultimate reward, the payoff for completing Skyrim's hardest and most inscrutable quest. Well, I'm not one to welch on a deal, so here's your reward. Hope you put it to good use. I know I have. And the reward is... Prowler's Prophet, a passive ability that increases the likelihood of finding gems when you search chests, burial urns, corpses, etc. Which we'd probably be very grateful for, Vex, if we thought we could ever see another gem in our lives without vomiting, and if we, you know, hadn't just proved ourselves the best gem finder in Skyrim already! Sorry, Vex, what I mean to say is thank you. Yeah, my thank yous always come out wrong too. think that catching every Pokemon is its own reward. I mean, unless you're a Pokemon. <laughs> they must hate it. Nevertheless, we're prepared to ensnare as many of these fantastical critters as necessary, and condemn every single one of them to a life filed away inside a PC in a Pokemon Center in pursuit of the ideal, the imperative that drives every Pokemon trainer, to catch them all. 
says it right there on the box. Unless you're playing Pokemon Yellow, in which case it says Special Pikachu Edition. But the point still remains, damn it. Getting every single Pokemon entered into your Pokedex has been the ultimate challenge posed by every Pokemon game since the very first, way beyond completion of the actual story. It's a very hard thing to do, requiring a great deal of time and putting yourself in catching distance of every single Pokemon, even the rubbish ones. Even Execute, which is just a bunch of eggs. Even Mr. Mime! That's how serious this thing is! So what's your reward for actually making a complete taxonomic record of every Pokemon, including some cloned from fossils, including some thought to be mere myth? Head to the condominiums in Celadon City to find the developers of the game itself hanging out who will hand over your reward a, uh, diploma. That's right, your reward for this most epic of quests is a 15-word certificate. The kind of prize you'd normally receive for completing an online yoga course or swimming five lengths of breaststroke. We'd go so far as to say this reward actually cheapens the achievement of catching all 151 Pokémon, which you probably previously assumed you were the first trainer in the Pokémon world to manage, seeing as the Kanto region is not exactly teeming with Mews. But the fact they're doling out certificates that are clearly identical apart from the name suggests actually loads of other trainers have managed this exact feat, and you're not unique at all, just one of many. Oh my god, that must be how Execute feels. I've badly misjudged it. Dark Souls is a difficult game, so it makes sense to seize upon any advantage you can. One favour the game does you is letting you dress your character, which doesn't sound like much, admittedly, but I guess that's how low our self-esteem has fallen after playing so much Dark Souls, that being allowed to put some scraps of leather and metal between ourselves and Executioner Smau's giant hammer feels like a tremendous privilege. Different armor sets confer different bonuses and resistances that can make all the difference in a particularly gruelling fight, and the same is true of rings, which are accessories that grant significant boons like faster stamina regeneration or higher equip load, though in typical Dark Souls fashion you can only wear two rings at once for some reason. I have ten fingers, Dark Souls, and ten toes, and several other places I could probably find room if it meant making this game a little easier. Because as we mentioned, the game is hard, and perhaps doesn't get harder than the battle with Calamite in the Artorius of the Abyss DLC. Calamite is a gnarly dragon who is A, outrageously strong, and B, flying around making your life miserable. You can address the flying part though if you undertake a little quest to inform your oversized mate Hawkeye Goff that Calamite is doing your head in. Bring him this intel and Hawkeye will obligingly 360 no-scope Calamite from clear across the map. Damn, Hawkeye Goff. Do you want to do the rest of the game? He does not, and so the end of this sequence is, of course, you fighting a mercifully grounded Calamite. Unfortunately, this hard-as-nails dragon isn't much more chill having had his wings clipped. If anything, it just brings you into closer proximity to his devastating claws and health bar shattering flame breath and well, frankly, if we started to list all the unpleasant things Calamite can do to your frail undead body, we'd be here all day. If you've the patience to beat what is arguably the hardest boss in a notoriously hard game, the death of Calamite will see you rewarded. First with souls, of course, that you can use to level up, though this far through the game it won't make a tremendous difference, and secondly with a unique one-of-a-kind ring, the Calamity Ring. Calamity. Uh, no, wait, let me guess. I'm thinking a boost to pyromancy? Maybe uh, increased lightning damage. Dragons are susceptible. Let's see. Doubles damage received by its wearer. 
Yes, the Calamity Ring does absolutely nothing except make it hurt twice as much when you get hit. It is, to quote the item description, a useless ring befitting of no finger. Mm, I can think of a finger you're befitting, Dark Souls. <laughs> Shadow of the Colossus is a game where you'll be doing a lot of climbing. Mostly climbing of the colossi that give the game its title. Gentlest giants who roam the land and that you, a lad called Wanda, are tasked with offing one by one if you can stomach the guilt. Which turns out you can, because Wanda's doing it all to save Mono, his pal who starts the game dead but who by the time the credits roll is very much alive, thanks in a roundabout way to your meddling. As the credits roll, you'll see Mono and your horse Agro taking a route out of the game's Shrine of Worship hub area that you haven't seen before. A path that takes them to a lush secret garden where Mono ends the game being charmingly pestered by more animals than a Snow White covered in trail mix. It's a peaceful and beautiful scene that led many players to ask, how can I get into the secret garden and jump in it and run around in it? The answer is you can't, because the garden is so high up that climbing to it requires more stamina than Wanda can possibly get in a single playthrough. The solution? Three playthroughs. That's right, start enough new game pluses to equip Wanda with a stonking amount of stamina, and you can undertake the greatest challenge Shadow of the Colossus offers to players, making it all the way up the side of the shrine to actually run around in the hidden garden from the end credits. And when you get there you find... Nothing. Much. Well, there is some fruit. Fruit that very much resembles the kind you see throughout the game. The kind that when archeryed off a tree and eaten, increases your max health. Except the fruit in the secret garden that you played for so long to get to permanently reduces your health and your stamina. Cool, 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 cool. Just have to pop over here for a second. Take this uh, sound isolating phone with me. It might seem like a sarcastically poor reward for making it all the way up, but game director Fumito Ueda has previously offered the following explanation, that the poison fruit in the garden, in contrast to the superpowered fruit found elsewhere, returns you to a more human existence. Which does make sense, so... No, sorry, sorry, I'll be right back. Three playthroughs, are you kidding me? Link from the Legend of Zelda series is like an octopus in that he has three hearts. Also, he has a chitinous beak, but Nintendo says they'll never let you see it. Also like an octopus, Link is never satisfied, so in almost every game, including The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker for the GameCube, he can be found solving simple puzzles or rooting around in his environment for pieces of heart. When four are gathered together, heart pieces net you one extra heart on your life bar for increased toughness in battle. Toughness in battle makes surviving the game easier, so players are encouraged to explore to find more heart pieces, usually by solving little puzzles like following a treasure map or getting a pig to dig one up for you. Cheers pig! If you could also bring together the Triforce and kill Ganondorf, that would be so great. In other words, pieces of heart are nice, but not exactly a momentous reward, and certainly not what any player would have expected to find as a reward for completion of the dungeon known in the game as the Savage Labyrinth. The good news is that as labyrinths go, this one is pretty easy to navigate. You just fall through the hole in each room to progress. The bad news is every other single thing about it. This hellish combat gauntlet requires Link to kill every enemy in each room before the floor below unlocks. There are a shocking 51 floors total of increasing difficulty with limited recovery items. Worst of all, it must be completed in one go, as dying sends you right back to the very start. <laughs> Ah. 
Getting partway through the labyrinth is mandatory as the 31st floor contains a Triforce chart you need to complete the game. Upon which most players will say, thank Nehru, get me the F out of here. But for especially ambitious, persistent or masochistic players, the option exists to plunge onwards through 20 even more brutal floors of savage combat, assuming you're hyped about fighting hordes of the hardest enemies in the game while zombies scream at you. Or perhaps you're just laser focused on what you assume will be a rich and exciting reward for anyone tough enough to make it through to the deepest part of this hellish mineshaft. But as you'll have guessed by now, uh-oh. That's right, your reward is a paltry piece of heart, which gets you one quarter of the way to a small HP increase that you provably do not need, because trust us, if you've got this piece of heart, you're strong enough already. There's an argument to say Nintendo knew it did wrong here, because in the HD remake of Wind Waker, your reward for completing the labyrinth is changed to be a mask that lets you see enemy health bars, which is at least a bit more interesting. But before you go throwing Nintendo a parade, you should also know that while the Western version of the GameCube original gave you a piece of heart, the reward for completing the Savage Labyrinth in the Japanese version of the game wasn't just terrible, it was sarcastically terrible. Make it to the 51st floor in the Japanese version of Wind Waker, and you won 10 rupees. Which is enough to buy a pair. Summon the pig, we're going to war. Ezio from the Assassin's Creed games sure loves fancy capes for a man who's supposed to be blending in with the general public. Several of these ornate, over-the-shoulder accessories are unlockable throughout your murderous journey, but one is significantly harder to add to your closet than all the others. That's the Auditori cape, which should be easy for Ezio to get seeing as his mum already has it. However, Mama Maria is selfishly guarding this fashionable item until you complete an infamously time-consuming and tedious side quest, collecting 100 feathers around town, because that's what her dead son Patricio loved doing. I still can't get her to talk. She spends all day and night in front of those feathers Petruccio used to collect. And now, we're not ones to tell anybody how to grieve, but finding those feathers for your mum is as challenging as it is dangerous. Two adjectives that are actually quite misleading, because they make the feather collecting quest sound even remotely exciting, which it isn't. That said, getting all 100 feathers does bring closure to Ezio's grieving mother, and if you consider that a reward, then this quest absolutely delivers. The cave's a real piece of sh** though. The auditory cape that you toiled so hard for has only one real attribute. It raises your wanted level to maximum, meaning while wearing it, Ezio can't so much as stroll to the shops without a conga line of murderous guards following at his heels. Wearing the cape renders the game more or less unplayable, but at least now we know why we never saw Mum wearing this particular garment to church on Sunday. Probably because she got tired of having to stop every five feet to fight a gang of soldiers to the very death. There, finally, that's the last one. Oh, for fellas, if you want one of your own, well, you can have this one, frankly. For a long time, Mario games involved platforming as Mario, and that was fine for a while. But only until the release of Super Mario World, when Nintendo revealed that all along we could have been platforming as Mario riding a dinosaur, and everything changed. That dinosaur was Yoshi, the mountable theropod who greatly enhanced the Mario series of platformers with his speedy sprinting, ability to swallow enemies whole, and chill attitude towards being thrown into the abyss whenever Mario needed an extra foot or so of jump distance. So when Mario 64 was released, we did miss running around astride Mario's scaly pal. But then, word began to spread that Yoshi was indeed in Mario 64, but could only be found as a reward for getting all 120 stars in the game. A challenge we were definitely up for. After all, if playing as Mario is this good in 3D, imagine how good firing Yoshi into the abyss will be! A 3D abyss! He'll probably scream in 64-bit sound! The hunt is on! 
And what a hunt it is! Beating Bowser and seeing the end of Mario 64 requires only 70 stars, but the Yoshi reward requires almost twice that number. Stars become more and more challenging to acquire as your total increases, meaning finding all 120 requires extreme patience and frankly Herculean feats of platforming prowess. If you manage this mighty task though, a cannon will activate in the castle grounds, letting you fire yourself up to the castle roof for a very special, long-awaited meeting. Oh ho ho, let me just move my legs into a Yoshi straddling position. Straight back, set hopes sky high. Right, reward time. First, Yoshi greets the player with a cheerful, Mario, it that really you? It that really, is that a typo? Okay, not a great start, but Yoshi's here to be ridden, not to give speeches. Yoshi goes on to deliver a thank you message from the Mario 64 team, but it is a simple prelude to your real prize. First, maxing out your lives. Bit weird, you should keep the lives, Yoshi. You're the one going into the abyss. All right, enough talk, let's saddle up. Then, when your life counter is at max, finally, it's time for Yoshi to let you ride him. Oh no, he's gone. Maybe he's gone to fetch a saddle? No, he hasn't. To our infinite disappointment and yours, there is no Yoshi riding in Mario 64. Despite that clearly being what everyone who collected all 120 stars and saw that sweet green dinosaur waiting up on the roof will have hoped for. Your reward was actually maximum lives. Not much use having already completed every challenge in the game, and oh, your triple jump is sparkly now, so you can enjoy some sparkles while reflecting on how much better this jumping would be if you were controlling Yoshi, if Yoshi hadn't left you. I guess he kind of goes into an abyss? It's not the same. Well done for completing the quest of watching this video. Your reward is... Please give us a like and uh, hit That's one of the... <laughs> watch one of these videos. We the and maybe subscribe, that'd be really great. And I'm so sorry. Maybe you can help us with our job by telling us more in the comments below. Oh, Thanks yeah, for watching. Our job's great reward. Bye. <laughs>